Well, uh, thanks everybody for being on today. I'm really uh, pleased with the turnout. Um, I'm learning a lot from our presenters. And as you know, we're eager to help all of our customers, um, you know, figure out how to make use of uh, all this technology in a new connected world and one where we think there's gonna be video everywhere. Um, and, you know, we would love to share that with our colleagues as well. So um, hopefully we're all gonna uh, end this day a little bit uh, more uh, knowledgeable about uh, what we're doing here. Um, if I can ask you to stop sharing, Nicole, I I'm not sure if my video is on the screen. So um, what I'd like to do, and Phil, I think you're ready to roll, so feel free to turn your video on. Um, the host is just disabled it. Oh, did I just, I just, you were disabled? All right, here we go. Ask to start video. Boom. All right, there you are. There's the handsome fellow. Um, and so it's, it's my real pleasure to uh, introduce you to our keynote speaker. Um, I'm very excited to hear uh, kind of his presentation. He could not be more relevant to this event and to these times. Um, let me just introduce you to Phil Simon. He is a frequent keynote presenter, recognized collaboration and technology authority and college professor for hire. He's the award-winning author of 11 books, most recently, Reimagining Collaboration, Slack, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, and the Post-COVID World of Work. Uh, that's this book right here. We're going to give a couple of them out at the end of uh, his session. Um, he helps organizations communicate, collaborate, and use technology better. Harvard Business Review, the MIT Sloan Management Review, Wired, NBC, CNBC, Business Week, and the New York Times have featured his contributions. He also hosts the podcast, Conversations About Collaboration. So without further ado, Phil, welcome and uh, take it away. Hey, David, thanks for the introduction. My name is Phil Simon. Thank you for your time. I've got 105 slides in 55 minutes, so let's rock and roll. A little bit of a plan of attack. Start with a quick introduction. I'll then quickly move into COVID-19 and the world of work. From there, I'll go to the explosion of internal collaboration hubs. If you don't know what one is, don't worry about it. You will in about 35 minutes, give or take. I'll then move to the big idea at the center of my new book, the hub spoke model of collaboration. It's my contention that most people are using their enterprise apps in a very disparate and disconnected kind of way. There is a need, I think, for a more cohesive approach and that's what I'll discuss. I'll end with some predictions about the future of work, some tech related, some not. And then I'll give you some tips about what you could do with this information to make your work life a little bit less chaotic and then we should have time for a Q&A and possibly a happy hour later on, but David and I are gonna chat about that. Excuse me, Phil, uh, your audio is a little bit low. I don't know if uh, there's something on the microphone. In How's Let's this, see. is this better? Uh, it's about the same. So maybe just kind of lean in if, or something, but it is unusually low. First time I've ever told, anyone's ever told me to speak up. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, that might be it. Just speak up and we'll do the best we can with, uh, the technology yeah, I, today. I, I, I did write Zoom for dummies, so I should be able to figure this out. How's One now? would think. One would think. How, okay. How's this? Is this better? Way better. Thank you. Way better. Okay. Let's go back to me. All right. So before we get going, apologies for that. Uh, warning, what's up with this? There we go. I am a big fan of pop culture references, and I love a good quote. And the quote of today is from Mr. Churchill, never waste a good crisis. No one can doubt that they're still in the myths of uncharted territory, but I would argue that there is enormous opportunity for organizations to fundamentally reimagine how they work. All right, so where are we now? We are, what, 19, 20 months into this madness? As it turns out, most U.S. workers, at least white-collar workers, continue to punch in virtually. This has ebbed and flowed a little bit pre-Delta. Some organizations obviously announced plans to come back to work, but even companies like Microsoft has recently said, we have no idea what's going to happen, so we're going to start trying to predict what will. Uh, roughly 56% of U.S. workers are working remotely at least part of the time, if not all the time, and more workers want to return to the office, but most employers, quite frankly, aren't ready to have them show up. And roughly a fourth of all workers would stay remote permanently if given the option. And that's very much in keeping with additional research. One third to one half of all workers recently said that they'd leave their jobs if employers didn't offer remote work at least part of the time. If you haven't figured it out, I'm a bit of a data geek. Here's some more data. 77%, what does this mean? It means that 
roughly three and four people want to work remotely because it makes them happier. As I'm fond of saying, we used to try to make our personal lives revolve around work. And thanks to COVID and working remotely, we don't want to go back, right? We enjoy picking up our kids from soccer practice or going for a lunch or not commuting two hours every day. We now want our work lives to revolve around our personal lives. And many employees are unwilling to go back to the pre-COVID world of work. Again, 54%, this is from Gallup, more than half of employees who would be willing to quit their job for one that involves remote work. And I think it was LinkedIn about three or four months ago that some economic research department announced that the percentage of jobs with the word, word remote in them went up something like 547% from a year ago. 80%, once CDC guidelines are lifted, roughly eight, four and five people want to work from home at least three times per week. It is interesting, this cuts different ways. Ironically, younger people are more inclined to want to go to the office either because they're living at home or they've got roommates and not a dedicated workspace or probably most important, they have not built the social capital at work. They are just an avatar in Slack or Microsoft Teams. They are not a real person. So with Delta, companies are delaying the reopening plans. A lot of them just don't know how things are going to turn out. And this has actually gone up quite a bit uh, recently. Uh, this is the most recent research from Gartner. Again, we, there's just so much uncertainty out here. We don't know how this is going to play out. Again, roughly uh, two and three as of August have delayed their reopening plans in some cases indefinitely. I'd actually love to meet the company's uh, presidents or CEOs who have said this has no impact on how they're working. Just how does that work out? In some cases, companies have closed individual sites. So really they're all over the place. But if there's a common theme here with the data, it's that there's just a great degree of uncertainty with when we're coming back, if at all. All right, so what happens if employers don't allow employees to continue to work remotely, right? It's a fair question. Again, you know, where is it written that you have to let employees work remotely? In some cases, you can compel people to come to work. Well, some of you may have heard the great resignation, but increasing numbers of employees are saying, I'll quit. In fact, I've heard statistics as much as 50% of people are planning to leave once the pandemic ends, if not before, or if they can't get a firm commitment from their employers about working remotely in the future. Here's some data from the Wall Street Journal. We've seen historic uptick in worker attrition. So a lot of this is pandemic related. Some of us are just quite quickly fried from Zoom fatigue, endless meetings, uncertainty about the world of work. Um, hopefully this will abate, but some people will say that the genie cannot be shoved back into the bottle. And even if you wanted workers to come back to work, in some qu cases, quite frankly, they can. The Wall Street Journal, rep Journal reported not that long ago that more than 7 million Americans moved to a different county during the pandemic. One of my books is on data visualization. Here's a good one. This shows how people are leaving, in many cases, cities. A lot of people are going to Florida. A lot of people left the Bay Area. A fantastic visualization here from the Wall Street Journal. You can see the link right here. But where specifically did people go? We're researching this for the book. I found that, yes, people moved away from large cities, New York, San Francisco, Seattle, Boston, Portland, very high cost environs. That, historically have attracted a lot of tech workers. Well, if you could work from anywhere, where would you go? So these are people who have really no desire to go back to a long commute or paying $3,000 a month for a one bedroom apartment. Jacksonville, Salt Lake City, Sacramento, Milwaukee, Kansas City. I've heard some housing markets like Montana and some places in Wyoming have become absolute hotbeds. So it's been really interesting to see how people have in some cases said, I'm not going back. And if that means I have to get a new job, then so be it. Okay. This begs the question, if people are not coming into the office and they're working at home, have they been more productive while doing so? It's a fair question. According to Gallup, more than three in four employees feel that they are being productive at home. In fact, being very productive. In some cases, you can attribute this to the fact that people aren't commuting. So what are they going to do with that one hour, say from eight to nine, they'd spend battling traffic or being on a train. By some accounts, the workday is now 48 minutes longer. And certainly there are a lot more meetings from that. Again, we might feel overwhelmed because we want to show that we are working even though we're not at work. So the question becomes, how can we make meetings more efficient? Slack uh, yesterday, I think, announced 
something called clips. I just actually wrote a blog post about it. Basically a way to record videos for asynchronous communication rather than spending an hour getting people to agree in a meeting time, just record a quick video with the message that you want to get out to folks. So expect more innovation along those lines. Right? And if people have been productive at home, I think there's a very good reason for this. Right? Go back to say 2018. Right, collaboration tools were certainly around, but they weren't as popular. I'll talk more about that in a minute. eBay, certainly a tech company. Smart folks actually spoke there back in 2014. Surveyed its employees in 2018 and found a massive gap. Right, most people agreed to the comment, well, sure, we're committed to collaboration, but our existing tools didn't allow us to be collaborative. Well, that really wasn't as acute of a problem if we were in person. So I could tap Nicole or David on the shoulder, right? I wouldn't have to send a bus a bunch of messages back and forth. So the tools have always been there, but I'd argue we really haven't been using them particularly well. But the pandemic has forced us to use these new collaboration tools. But don't believe me, again, I'm a big fan in, of data. So I'm talking about Zoom, Teams, Slack, Google Workspace, which they used to call the G Suite. Uh, I wonder who does their marketing because their branding is all over the place or something like Cisco WebEx. Right? So with the pandemic, we saw a mass adoption of these collaborative tools in a very short period of time. This brings up one of my favorite quotes from Vladimir Lenin. There are decades where nothing happens and then there are weeks when decades happen. Again, let's be specific. Microsoft Teams was really a niche tool in 2018. Well, before you know it, it was up to 145 million active users. That's an astonishing number in a short period of time. Now, whether or not people are actually using those tools to their fullest potentials, I suspect, but I'll get to that shortly. Slack ponied, I'm sorry, Salesforce ponied up $28 billion for Slack, the collaboration tool that Microsoft allegedly tried to buy. They wouldn't have done that if they thought that we were going back to the pre-COVID world of work. But arguably the poster child for collaboration technology and the growth is Zoom, right? If you bought Zoom stock in, oh, I don't know, February of 2020 and held it, you're going to be pretty happy. In December of 2019, Zoom sported 10 million fundamentally business users. That number exploded to 200 million primarily consumer users in March of 2020, and then 300 million in April of 2020. There's a reason that my publisher Wiley reached out to me to write Zoom for Dummies. Trust me, that was not on their roadmap before the pandemic. But once things hit, they realized an opportunity. They know that I can write quickly and hopefully well. So they reached out to me and now Zoom for Dummies is a thing. Again, if you had bought Zoom stock, you are one happy camper. But Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Slack, those are just a number of the different tools that organizations use. Okta does identity management and recently released a report on the tools that people use or the number of tools. Even small organizations use roughly 70, 75 tools. Big organizations, sometimes two or three times that. With tech tools, that number is usually 150, at least for tech companies, okay? So that number has exploded. The idea that we can only use one or two apps is absolutely insane. So rather than just pontificate about how you use different tools or which tool you, tools you use, it's time to ask a few poll questions. And I don't know, Nicole or uh, Mariel, if you're setting this up here, but I think I had sent them to you. Let's see if we'll see the results here. Who's running the poll? Uh, David is. Okay. And yeah, maybe just a few more seconds, David. So let's see what the most popular tools are, and then let's see how good people are at using them. It's all anonymous, so I'm, I'm good with revealing results. If you are, David, it's your yeah. handy story. Uh, I see the results, but I take it that uh, you guys do not. So uh, shall I end the poll now? Sure. All right, I'll share the results. Okay, Teams and Zoom, I would have expected that. Okay. And then, wow, 
love the confidence. If we could scroll down, looks like uh, two thirds of us rank ourselves as baller. I love it. <laughs> okay, so we are pretty good at using these tools. Let's see if that holds up. Right. Which industries are best suited for return to work? I would argue that if you were a tech worker, right, the idea of working from home really wasn't a big change, but certain industries don't really lend themselves to that. This brings up one of my favorite quotes from the sci-fi writer, William Gibson, and fun fact, creator of the cyberpunk genre, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. Okay. So McKinsey ran the numbers and not unexpectedly, again, for lack of a better term, knowledge work or white collar work was much more uh, equipped to deal with this. As someone who spent four years as a college professor, I could tell you from the inside, when the you know what hit the fan, we were absolutely not ready for the massive change that was going to take place. Uh, in a nutshell, all hell broke loose, broke loose. So it doesn't surprise me that education is really trailing there. Real estate as well, kind of tough to do virtual tours overnight, but companies are absolutely working on it. So given that there are differences among the different industries, this begs the question, how are companies planning for the future? In a nutshell, there are three buckets. Companies either envision all employees on site always remote or hybrid. Let's break these down. So bucket number one, we want to go back to the pre-COVID world. Not surprisingly here, you'll see a lot of traditional companies, right? Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, uh, Amazon, they just feel that there's a certain magic or kismet that happens when people get together in real time. And I certainly can't dispute that, right? Some things are easier done in person versus asynchronously or even over some of these collaboration tools. So they want to go back through Monday through Friday, nine to five. Again, law firms typically fall into this bucket. And the general premise here is that collisions happen, right? I run into someone in the hallway, that person gives me an idea, or I'm able to resolve a problem a lot quicker than if I had to schedule a meeting. So that's the first bucket. Number two, employees can work wherever they want. I'm talking about Twitter, uh, Shopify, uh, interesting Lincoln Financial Group. I wouldn't put that on the list. Uh, companies like Dropbox. Again, a lot of tech companies feel that it really doesn't matter where and when you work, right? So we're seeing this here. Employees hired during the pandemic. So here's my first day at work, right? He's obviously in his home, okay? As I mentioned before, remote work is absolutely exploding according to Lincoln that number is 457%. That's the percentage of jobs with the word remote in the title. And again, not unexpectedly, tech and media are leading the way there. Okay. The next one is obviously the most difficult to adopt, a hybrid approach. There are all sorts of logistical problems associated with this, but this is clearly what a large percentage of employees want. Right? Why is it more difficult? Right? If you're Citibank, if you're, say, Salesforce, right? or other companies like Ford, TIA, CREF, Target, right? these are high-profile companies that have outlined their return-to-work plans, or at least tried to before the Delta step, step in the way. Again, that is particularly difficult to do, but it's clear that employees, in many cases, don't want to go back in the office. Right? In some cases, they've already moved. But Call me a cynic, but if you don't realize by the age of 30 that the answer to just about every question in life is money, well, you'll never figure it out. And I won't take credit for that quote. This is Don Olmeyer. He was the former producer of Monday Night Football. It's one of my favorite quotes. What specific savings could companies expect to realize? Oh, I don't know. How about real estate? Right? So some companies have said, a part, oh, I'll get to real estate shortly. Uh, first of all, and this is starting to wobble a little bit, if we're paying an engineer to live in San Francisco and that engineer moves to Montana, well, maybe that person doesn't need to make the same amount of money. So I would be shocked if more companies don't impose this type of pay cut on employees if they're going to be working away from the office, especially if companies have to eat travel fare for the employees to come to the office once a month or once a quarter. Next up, real estate. Right as things are really getting bad, in August, Pinterest said, you know what, keep your $90 million. Uh, we are going to terminate an office lease in San Francisco, right? Major savings there, right? There is this massive opportunity. But again, it isn't just about saving a few bucks. There's arguably a massive opportunity for organizations to really reimagine the future. This is Brian Elliott. He runs the Slack Future Forum. It's part of Slack, which is part of Salesforce after the acquisition. And he's done with his team a great deal of research on the potential to really 
reimagine a better way of working. A nice guy was actually on my podcast. But again, there are other considerations for opening up your labor force to not just people who are willing to come into the office. This is Sundey Pichar. He's the chief executive of Alphabet. That's the parent company of Google. And at a Reuters conference in December of 2020, he said that the company was committed to making hybrid work possible. Right? There is this opportunity to make employees more productive, plus they can tap into a larger workforce. So what would the future of work look like at Google? Well, they're still trying to figure it out, but think about this. This is a great New York Times piece that ran a couple of months ago. They're talking about customizable workspaces and balloon walls, but most important for this audience, I believe, is you see the prevalence of audiovisual equipment. You don't want someone to be a second-class citizen because he or she has to call in on a Zoom call. In fact, some organizations are mandating, even in hybrid work, everyone call in through a Zoom call. That way, you don't think of the people calling in as lesser than. All right? So you might see people sitting next to screens, which gets into this whole Mark Zuckerberg metaverse thing. And if you want to read that article, I can make the slides available later, but here is the link. Okay. So there are lots of benefits of hybrid workplaces, right? For starters, companies can give employees what they want, right? You can say we're employee friendly, but do you compel people to be in the office nine to five, five days a week? Or do you say you'll have to come in two or three days a week, which again is what quite a few employees have expressed a preference to do. I'd also argue that you can attract and retain coveted employees. Right? If people can work from anywhere, you're now competing with organizations that aren't in your geography. So what do I say about this whole thing? We are just scratching the surface of what these collaboration tools can do. Right? I'm talking about using Zoom as Skype 2.0 or Microsoft Teams as email 2.0. There is so much more that we can do with these tools. And again, that's the premise of the book. I'd argue that the way that we're using these tool, tools now is kind of similar to having a Lexus convertible and using it as an ornate coffee holder. And that is not my joke. That's from Gary Goldman, one of my favorite comedians, definitely worth checking out, right? Or it's analogous to using your phone as a phone, right? You can do that, but I'm going to bet that everyone on this call uses the apps on his or her phone a lot more than the actual phone app. Okay. So I started thinking about in say August of last year, when it became evident that this pandemic wasn't going away and that people did not want to return to the pre-COVID world of work, what if we used these collaboration hubs uh, in a much more profound or much more holistic way? And that's really the genesis of what I coined as an internal collaboration hub, right? Think of this as a digital headquarters, right? Generally use software that design, it's designed to promote effective communication and collaboration. So think about all of your organization's conversations, decisions, documents, all that institutional knowledge in one place, not an inbox, right, that dies when somebody leaves the organization. I'm talking about a semi-public area. And these hubs can connect to different spokes. I'll explain what I mean about that shortly, but they also allow for automation and you do not have to be a coder to do this. Again, we are just scratching the surface of what these tools can do. And the most popular ones I'd argue are Slack, Microsoft Teams, and Zoom. Although it's very difficult to define Google. They've got so many different chat tools. I was actually looking at an article the other day that was, oh gosh, something like 30,000 words long, tracing the history of all Google's collaboration tools. It was a bit confusing even to me. So these internal collaboration hubs connect all the different applications within your organization. What does that mean? I'm talking about ERP, CRM, I'm assuming that some of you use DocuSign or a different e-signature tool, right? Whether it's Microsoft Office 365 or Google Workplace, right? Ticket management systems, if you use Zendex, et cetera, et cetera. All these things you would connect to the hub. And rather than constantly switching back and forth, you can actually spend much more time in the hub and less time switching back and forth or trying to find things because it's basically in one place. Now, there are a lot of different visuals that you can use here. You can look at, say, Slack or Microsoft Teams as this quote unquote platform, and these other things live on top of it. This is just something that I designed, but even Slack thinks about things this way. So, again, Slack is at the center of the universe, but then you've got Zoom, DocuSign, email, uh, Google Drive. So, this is the model at the beginning of the book to connect all these things together, which begs the question how do you do that? Right? Do I have to call IT? Do I have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on software developers? The short answer is no. 
these collaboration hubs easily connect to all sorts of different third party applications. Just as one example, I'm a fan of the project management tool Asana. It's a bit like Smartsheet or Trello or Monday.com. There are a million project management tools out there. Every organization has to manage projects of some sort. You could certainly use Microsoft Office or email if you want, but I'd argue that something like 80,000 or 85,000 different organizations use Asana. All right, so it's a particularly popular tool. Uh, millions of organizations use the free version, but again, over 80,000 use the paid one in something like 190 different countries. So let's say that you wanted to connect your hub, Slack, Microsoft Teams, whatever, to Asana, right? So if you're a Microsoft Teams user, guess what? You basically can install, install the app on top of Teams, just like you'd install an app on your phone. And once you've done that, boom, in Microsoft Teams, you've got Asana. So you can interact with Teams. You can get notifications from Microsoft Teams. Well, there were some of you when I did that poll earlier who said that they were Slack users, right? Rock on. Turns out that Slack is not forgetting about Asana and vice versa. You can easily install Slack with, I'm sorry, Asana within Slack. If you can click a button and use a mouse, again, you don't need to learn how to code. What about Zoom? Zoom actually, as I write about in Zoom for Dummies, offers so much more than video meetings. You can use the same chat features, send files, embed code snippets, but you can also install apps. So if I'm holding a meeting with someone and we're talking about a project, guess what? I can access Asana within Zoom, right? So that's just one particular example, but there are lots of them. Okay. So what if there are no native integrations for our company's essential systems and apps? right? Do we have to switch apps, right? Oh, shoot, they don't have this out of the box for Slack. Maybe we got to move everything to Microsoft Teams. Well, not necessarily. There are these connectors there. This is the first option. I'm talking about Zapier, AirSlate, If This Then That, Airtable, Workado. These are tools that, again, allow you to effectively create recipes. If I don't see a connection for Asana to Zoom, Maybe somebody has built that. So that is option A, basically taking advantage of software that lets you plug and play again with zero coding required. But then of course there's option B and yes, I'm an enormous fan of Breaking Bad. This is the more technical option. If that connector doesn't already exist, then you certainly can hire a software developer using software development kits, webhooks and application programming interface, uh, interfaces to basically tie these things together. But again, that should be your last option. Odds are that if you use Trello, there's probably a Trello app for Microsoft Teams. And if not, there's one of these other connector tools that's already out there, okay? So if you stitch all these different tools together into one holistic entity, right? What are some of the benefits of that? Or as Brad Pitt said in uh, Ocean's 11, why do this? I'd argue that the quality of your collaboration will increase because everything is taking place in one environment. You don't have some people using Slack and some people using Zoom and some people using Microsoft Teams and you get this pissing contest with folks saying, well, you have to use my team, not your, uh, your, my tool, not your tool. And I think that's just silly, but let's be more concrete about it. In the book, there's the sidebar of this company, Offer Up. I'm assuming some of you heard of them. If you haven't, it's basically a mobile first Craigslist. You can offer up something usually to your neighbors. Maybe you're getting rid of a lawnmower or something. Offer Up was just using the bare minimum of Slack. And when new leadership took over, they moved absolutely everything and effectively adopted the HubSpoke model. And they said there was absolutely no going back. They were able to collaborate a lot better. But again, there are more benefits to adopting this type of model. I'd argue that you can reduce or eliminate manual work, right? How many times are you copying and pasting things into multiple systems or multiple spreadsheets? Again, with these automations, it is amazing how I can get a notification. Let's say that I create a Google doc and someone comments on it and responds to it. I don't get an email for that, right? I'm not a big fan of email. I get a context specific notification in a Slack channel and it's Google docs telling me, hey, you forgot to give so-and-so access to this. I can click there, boom, access granted. Again, I don't have to multitask quite as much. Also, organizations can become more transparent because you're conducting things out in the open, right? Again, there are limits to this, right? You don't necessarily want to publicize everything to the world, but if I'm putting something in a public or a private Slack channel or Zoom or Microsoft Teams, then at least other people can feel included or involved. And you might think, well, 
I own a company and I know that our employees feel involved. They feel like things are transparent. Well, there's actually a big gap there, right? According to Kelton Global, which did a survey with Slack, roughly one half of all business owners describe their organizations as very transparent. If you think that employees, there are fewer employees agreed with that assessment, trust your instincts. So many times employees feel that it, decisions take place outside their knowledge. And if you use a tool like Slack or Microsoft Teams, you can at least inform people or poll people. There are all sorts of ways to encourage that type of engagement with employees who, while not in the office, are, I would argue, not feeling particularly engaged. So how would you adopt the HubSpoke model of collaboration, right? Well, there are lots of ways to do it. I'll get to a few of them shortly, but one of the massive benefits here is building what I'll call a comprehensive knowledge repository. Let me unpack that for a second, right? Again, all of your organization's decisions, all of the documentation exists in one place. So if Dennis or, or Mariel left my company, at some point, they probably had something interesting to say. Maybe they made a decision. Right? Maybe they contributed a document, maybe they uploaded something, doesn't matter. That information should not exist in their inbox, which effectively dies when those people leave the organization. Right? Again, it also reduces the time that people need to find documents. And this is a big problem here. You might say, well, is it an email? Is it in WhatsApp or text or box.net or one box? It's very difficult to search across all these different things. In fact, um, this is a bit of a dated study, but I'd argue that it still applies. Organiz employees often spend hours trying to find basic documents or they create a separate template when already one existed. So McKinsey back in, I think it was 2012, estimated that employees could save 20 to 25% of the time if organizations adopted and used more collaborative tools. Right. Next up, again, you don't need to multitask as much. I can't overstate this. Right. In some cases, they say that it takes you one to two minutes to get back to your train of thought if you leave an app and to get back to that deep flow state that people talk about. In, in some instances, that can take sometimes 10 to 15 minutes. Right. So if I have everything in Slack or Microsoft Teams or Zoom, I can stay focused there. And you might say, well, what about all those pings and those notifications? I wrote a post on my site, I don't know, maybe three, four months ago in defense of Slack because Cal Newport, who's a Georgetown professor and a very smart guy, best-selling author, has come out basically saying that Slack is email 2.0. And again, I just that's just not true, right? With your inbox, you typically go bing, bing, bing all the day and you're constantly playing whack-a-mole. But there are all sorts of ways in Teams, in Zoom, in Slack to customize your, customize your notifications. Maybe I don't want to hear from the general channel. Maybe I only want to hear from David, or maybe I only want to get notified when certain keywords come up. Maybe I want to set my active hours so people don't annoy me during the day and I can focus on what I need to do. The geek in me, though, is most excited about the following, setting the stage for enhancements in artificial intelligence and machine learning. The latter, the latter is just a subset of the former. So think about this. If all of your communication, all of your collaboration, all of your work takes place in one corpus, what could you do with that information? I don't know if anyone's ever seen the Joaquin Phoenix movie, Her. It's basically about a guy who falls in love with an operating system that's implanted in his head. And it doesn't hurt that it has a sexy voice from Scarlett Johansson. But over time, that operating system learns what makes him tick, so he falls in love with it. The same thing could take place with these collaboration hubs. Right? Maybe David is more of a morning person and I, the hub understands not to send him notifications unless they're urgent at a certain time of day. Right? Over time, it would learn that. And I'm not simply talking about using urgent in a subject line of an email. If you think about it, that's kind of a primitive way of doing it. So I honestly believe that five to seven years from now, these tools will become so sophisticated that they'll be able to do things like predict which employees are less engaged or are white guys like me crowding out the conversation. Right, which employees are really valuable beyond their job title. The potential here with AI and machine learning is enormous. So that's the book in a nutshell. And as promised, here are some predictions. I'll start with hubs and spokes. And I pay close attention to what Microsoft, Zoom, Google Workspace, Slack, they're all doing. So next up, I think that this trend will continue. For internal communication, yes, there are still plenty of organizations that rely upon email, but I think that those become few and far between. Slack does not mean, or Microsoft Teams or Zoom, the end of email, right? And even though I'm not a big fan of Dmail, 
of email, David and Mary will know that. We've been communicating throughout the planning process almost exclusively through Microsoft Teams. You still are going to want an email for the rest of the world, right? And as much as I hate email, when someone emails me about a speaking gig or buying a bunch of my books, I'm not displeased. I'd also argue that hubs will become more external. What do I mean by that? So right now, I'm making the case for internal collaboration hubs. But Slack, three years ago, I think, launched something called Share Channels. They've now rebranded it as Slack Connect. If Microsoft isn't working on this, I'll eat my hat. But imagine two universities that do research with each other. Let's say that it's Carnegie Mellon and the University of Pittsburgh. I went to CMU, so go Tartans. Gotta love a school. Its uh, official color is plaid, but that's neither here nor there. Right. So Pitt and Carnegie Mellon are doing research. Why can't there be a secure tunnel right, through which you could send encrypted information? You say, well, couldn't you send emails back and forth? Absolutely. But I'm betting that everyone on the call gets at least one spam message per, di per day. Uh, Bill Gates famously said, I want to say in 2004 that spam will be a thing of the past in two years. Oops. So the idea that email is as secure as, say, Slack Connect or some of these other tools, I think, is insane because you need a specific invite to get into one of these channels, right? You can't just get in. Does that mean that they're hack proof? No, of course not. But all things being equal, well, they are more secure than just doing things over email. So I think that more of these companies will take a page from Slack. All of these vendors steal from each other, right? I'm not just talking about the consumer side with Snap adopting Facebook stories or iOS 15 dropped earlier this week. And my Android friends say, oh, you guys finally caught up to us, right? So all of these vendors are paying attention to what they're doing. Next up, I have not seen any research on this, but all things being equal, I strongly believe that the companies that adopt this model and use these collaborative tools in a more efficient way will do better. That doesn't mean if you're starting a BlackBerry business right today or a Beeper business, <laughs> you're going to outperform Apple. But the companies that use these tools the way they can be used, I think honestly will do a lot better than the companies that don't. And I also think that things will become tightly more integrated. Now, I make this prediction in the book, but in February of 2021, Microsoft announced something called Project Viva. It is not lacking for ambition. Effectively, Microsoft wants to wrap the entire universe into Teams. So Teams becomes that quote unquote platform, that operating system. And I'm not just talking about PowerPoint and Excel. I'm talking about everything, even third party systems. If you use as your ERP, Workday, or Salesforce as your CRM. It is a massive shift, and they are betting that these hubs and spokes will continue to evolve over time. I made this call in Zoom for Dummies back in, oh, what was it, May of 2020. Zoom third-party apps will explode, and I hit that one out of the park. In February of 2021, Zoom announced that there are more than 1,000 apps for the Zoom marketplace. Now, this is a more educated audience when it comes to AV than some of the other audiences to whom I've given this webinar. But people who only think about Zoom as Skype 2.0 can't understand this, right? In fact, someone was tweeting at me the other day saying, how could you write a 400 page book on Zoom? Did you use a really big font? The short answer is no, it could have been an 800 book. And I'm sure that some of you on this call know that Zoom is a very powerful tool. I'm talking about VoIP. I'm talking about the Zoom hardware. I've got a D10 that they sent me for free, go Zoom. I'm talking about webinars and I'm talking about the message and chat feature, not just video. So as I showed you before with Asana, there are lots of different things that you can do with Zoom beyond, beyond just doing a video call, uh, whiteboarding features, different things like that. So again, these trends were already underway, arguably the biggest um, lesson from the pandemic may be that accelerated trends that were already in place. Okay. I'll make a few other work related predictions and I'll give you some tips. All right, uh, next up. Um, we're going to see more and more technology enter the workforce, right? We, Mark Zuckerberg famously talked about the metaverse. We're hearing more about AR and VR, but we may wind up seeing holograms in the future, insert your obligatory Star Wars reference, right? Coworking, I think, is going to come back with a vengeance, right? We do have this need to interact with folks. And if people are going to be living in different places, they may not want to schlep to the office, right? Co-working may wind up doing well. WeWork, which went busted evaluation at $48 billion. Um, if you haven't read it, there are a couple of great books out there on them. But I think that it may have been just ahead of the game and wildly overvalued. But this idea behind co-working in a safe way, 
I would bet on so much so that I would be astonished if Airbnb does not get into commercial real estate. I've used Airbnb five or six times for travel. I don't see why I couldn't use that in a work setting. So tips. I've ranted now for roughly 45 minutes about collaboration. How can you get started? How can you operationalize this when you go back to work tomorrow? Well, if I haven't convinced you of it, I would say ditch email as a means of com internal communication. I wrote an entire book about this called Message Not Received. If I didn't write it, I think I would have needed to see a therapist, but it just wasn't designed for collaboration, right? It doesn't capture this institutional knowledge. And even if it did, it dies the second that someone leaves the company. Now, there are instances, as I'm sure you've seen, in which IT will resurrect someone's email because it attains something important, but that is the exception, not the rule, okay? Next up, email only provides one bite at the apple. How many times have you sent an email? Oops, I forgot the attachment. Then you send another email, or you made a typo or forgot to CC someone, right? One of the benefits of Slack, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, these other internal collaboration hubs is that you can edit messages, and you will see edited by, but that is an enormous time saver. If I catch myself in a typo, I can easily fix that without bombarding that person with another email, right? Or not bombarding that person and proving that I don't know the difference between there, there, and there. Context, right? I was a college professor for four years. I used Slack. I would not accept emails from students. Why? Because it was, hi, I'm David. I have a question about homework assignment number one. Okay, stop. You're David. What class are you in? Which David? There are three Davids in this class. Right. But by sending it to me in Slack, I immediately had that context. And if the student used the channel right, let's say it was homework assignment number 11 as the channel, then I immediately knew that that question was about homework assignment number 11. And I didn't have to spend any time, even a second or two, trying to figure out what this person needed. If the average corporate person gets, at least prior to the pandemic, anywhere from 120 to 150 emails per week, I'm sorry, per day even two or three seconds can make you feel drained at the end of the day. As I mentioned before, email notifications are binary. They're basically yes or no. And that's insane, right? The idea that any email is important. And yes, you can set up rules if it's important and send it to this. If it contains this email address, send it to my phone. But it is very easy to customize your notifications, even on different devices, right? There's an entire chapter in Slack for dummies and Zoom for dummies as well on notifications. They are quite frankly, it's easier to focus on what you need to focus on. And this idea that you can connect email to third party apps, again, it just wasn't designed for that. Okay. Next up, pick a lane. Yes, there's software out there, particularly one vendor called Miro that builds tools that effectively link together Microsoft Teams and Zoom or Zoom or Slack or Zoom and Microsoft Workspace. You can certainly mix and match, but why bother? Pick a lane and run with it. I just don't see the point in part of the organization using one tool and part of it using another tool, right? It's not like there are any kind of file limitations on these paid plans. So trying to combine them into one monstrosity, I'd argue, doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm a big fan of using the hub as part of the hiring process. You ask any candidate, are you collaborative? Oh, sure, absolutely. What are they supposed to say? No. So create a guest account. You can do this for Microsoft Teams, Zoom, Slack, doesn't matter. And if that candidate doesn't interact with you with that hub, you can still hire that person, but that is an interesting data point on whether that person is truly collaborative, right? And I'm also not a fan of giving people a pass, right? If I say, David, you don't have to use Microsoft Teams for internal communication, you're special. Well, if you email folks and CC people, then effectively you're moving the conversation out of Microsoft Teams. So wait, where was that? Was that in Teams or was that an email? Oh, I don't know, was David involved? Why bother? Rip off the Band-Aid. Everyone should use it. I don't see why executives ought to be exempt from this type of thing. I think, that, I think that it sends a really dangerous message to other layers of the organization. If you're adopting the HubSpoke model, remember that size probably matters. Again, equip with no other information. If you tell me that there's a 5,000-person organization versus a 50-person organization, I will say that it's going to be easier to collaborate in the smaller organization. People hate change. I think it was Peter Sange, the management theorist, who said, that they hate change as long as it's um, not their idea, right? So, um, next up, are there existing business processes that you could at least partially automate? I'd argue that the answer is sometimes yes. There's an example in my book about expense reports back when people used to travel. And many times in my career, I've gone back and forth with people with email attachments and filling out Excel spreadsheets, but there's an Expensify app for Slack. I'd be shocked if there isn't one or a connector for Zoom 
Microsoft Teams, Google Workspace, et cetera. So you can significantly automate collection of this. And if I see that the person who handles my expense report has a little green icon, meaning that person's available, I don't have to go back and forth and messages. Boom, screen share. What's the issue? Oh, I spent $70 on dinner. I wasn't supposed to do that. But a boom, bada bang, solved the problem. And a lot of this is a management or a cultural issue, right? Again, I used to live in Las Vegas. And I remember talking to a startup founder back in 2015 when Slack was just getting started. And I'd heard of it. I mentioned it in my book, Message Not Received. Tell me about how you collaborate there. Well, we had to let someone go. Why? Because she would not use Slack. She kept using email and it really derailed the conversation. So I'm not saying if someone makes a mistake, there's the door. But if someone routinely violates the company policy around this, I do think that it's a big deal. Again, why is she special? She doesn't have to use it, but I do. That doesn't seem fair. Okay. Start connecting new spokes to your hub. Again, you don't have to be technical about it. You could even start with something like a Google Doc. You install the app in Slack, in Microsoft Teams, in Zoom, whatever. And once you see how easy it is, you start to think about other ways to do this type of thing. Okay. Here's a little bit more about me. Thank you for your time. And we should have some time for questions. So Phil, um, I wish you knew a little bit more about the subject. Uh, we were a little, little shocked how little you, you know about this. Just kidding. That was, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you, you actually took me seriously there for a minute. Um, I, I will say I learned a lot because we are, as an organization, uh, adopting uh, these you know, technologies. And um, just the tips at the end were worth the price of admission. But uh, we do have a couple couple questions here. Uh, and, and I'm interested in this one as well. So uh, the question is, how is the search function, for example, in Teams compared to email? Many people use email to look for past conversations and files. Yeah, it's pretty powerful and it's always getting better. I'm a big fan of using quotes just like you would with Google. So if I search for Phil Simon, I'll get Phil and then I'll get Simon. But if I search for quotes, Phil Simon, I only get me. And of course, it's always about me or negative keywords, right? So there are other Phil Simons. I'm not that special. There's a Phil Simon who runs an art clinic. There's a Phil Simon who's a, a, an art um, museum. There's a, someone else who runs, a, who's a doctor. So with keywords and negative keywords, and you can also restrict things from certain people um, during certain dates in certain channels with attachments. Um, I, I did not write Teams for Dummies. The second edition of that just dropped, but Again, these vendors steal from each other. So if I am looking at one or more of these hubs, and again, Slack does have a free version, but if to get all the goodies for a big company, you probably want to pay for it. Why would Microsoft offer that? So um, again, I'm not an expert on Microsoft Teams, but I pay attention to it. I'd be shocked if I couldn't find exactly what I wanted, especially if I use those keywords and negative key, basically Booleans, right? Ands and ors. Um, <clears throat> this is a little bit uh, particular, but if you're going to plug in these spokes into your hub, does search search across all of them or is it really only searching within the hub and the chats and, and that sort of thing? Yeah. If, okay. So it's, it's going to depend on the specific spoke. Um, if I am managing a project in Trello, I may be able to use the Trello app to search projects. Something tells me though that it's not quite as robust. Um, again, as I write in the book, there, I, I don't envision a future, David, in which there's one sort of mega app that does everything. That's just insane, right? Again, looking at that Okta study, it wasn't surprising to me that companies use so many. But I do think, think that these hubs can connect them better. But I, I'm not going to pretend that there is one app that you can use exclusively from Slack. I just I don't see that happening because... Could you, you know, again, using the Google Docs as an example, could I grant somebody access? Could I respond to a comment? Could I get a notification? Sure. Could I create a Google Sheet pivot table in Slack? I don't see that happening. Right. Um, we have a number of educators on the call, and you yourself are a professor for hire, you said. Um, do you have any commentary on how these new tools can be incorporated uh, or speak to you know how education is delivered and you know our education folks on the call. Absolutely, one of the most popular posts on my site for a long time was how I use Slack in the classroom, and you could substitute the same for Microsoft Teams. So again, I used Slack because I despise email and because of the power asymmetry. I couldn't tell the department chair, "Well, I'm not going to return your emails." Right? It just doesn't work that way. 
Um, so I found that it was particularly useful to be consistent and not respond to email because then where did I get David's message? Did I get it in Slack? Did I get an email? And there was one student who halfway through a semester sent me an email and said, what makes you think that an email all of a sudden is by a tool du jour? Uh, I'd also say that in an in-person class, try to use Slack or Microsoft Teams there. That way it's an extension of the classroom. So just as an example, I used to do anonymous polls in Slack right, through in the classroom if we were talking about a particularly thorny issue, something that could get political really quickly. It's a very mm -hmm. polarized society today. So not just using it um, when they weren't, when they were away from the class, but also using it in the class or even some screen sharing exercises. When I taught the analytics capstone course at ASU, I'd say, okay, go find an ugly data visualization and paste it into Slack. I'd share my screen on the, uh, on the, uh, on, um, uh, with the class and then they could see things updating. So again, um, there are ways, especially since they don't have a choice, right? You, you can compel them to learn, which I kind of liked. Excellent. Uh, let me see. I think I do see another question in the Q and A. <clears throat> All right. Uh, notwithstanding some of your statistics, I talked to my colleagues and many comment about the mental toll, the feelings of isolation and frustration with executing tasks, frustration with the effectiveness of cyber conversations versus in person, and the fact that some collaborations simply are more effective in person. Um, I'm not sure. I don't read a question in there. Um, but I guess, what's your comment on that, on that observation? Oh, there's no doubt, right? Zoom fatigue is a real thing, right? And some types of collaborations are more effective in person. I'll never say otherwise. Um, so I don't think that the future will be exclusively remote. Now, there's some companies for some types of jobs might say that Salesforce is a great example. They've said that for coders, work wherever. We may call you in the office once in a while, but we basically don't care. Now, if you're doing security, right, physical security, if you're doing food preparation, <laughs> That's kind of tough to do remotely. So I, I agree. And that's why I do think that hybrid work is going to be the most challenging. How do you determine who needs to be office when? Some companies are actually eschewing the term office. They don't want to be known for that. They want to be known as collaboration centers, right? So you can get together specifically to collaborate. I can't put on my genie hat, but if I do, I, I really see it's almost silly that I need to commute an hour and a half each day just to sit there and code so my boss can watch me work, right? And I completely agree with you. A brainstorming session, um, any kind of company um, pep rally, for lack of a better term, if I'm having a performance management discussion, do I really want to tell you over Zoom, David, that you're not very good and you're going to be fired? If anyone's ever seen the movie Up in the Air with George Clooney, right, where they were firing people remotely at the end, <laughs> no one wants yes. to do that, so... Uh, great, great movie, but uh, no, I, I completely agree. Um, Zoom is not the solution. Zoom fatigue is a very real thing. All right, thank you. I think I see another one here. Uh, oh, uh, it's a follow-up and kind of the, from the previous uh, question. I guess my question is, what do companies do about helping employees with these effects? There's a real opportunity there. I don't have all the answers. I'm certainly not a wellness expert. I've heard about things like employee resource group. So they'll try to solicit the concerns of folks. Um, some companies have even said on a, on a Thursday, hey, you all have tomorrow off as a mental health day. Mm. Uh, I, I want to stay in my lane. I like to think I know a few things about a few things, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not a doctor or a psychologist. You know, recognizing there's a problem, uh, certainly empathy goes a long way. Um, but I don't think that the solution to that kind of problem is necessarily another app. I think that we can use, use these tools better to minimize the being overwhelmed. So for example, many companies have adopted core hours, right? Regardless of where you work, let's say in the United States, we want you to be available from 10 to two, right? So from 10 to two, you have to take a meeting, you have to respond to things in a reasonable fashion. If you're a morning person, get up at six, get your work done, boom, you're done at two. If you're a night person, get up at 10, be part of core hours and work for the rest of the day. Um, so it is going to be fascinating. Again, we are in an uncharted territory here. Some companies will do it better than others. I'm actually speaking at a panel in Phoenix in real life, not on Zoom tomorrow, specifically <laughs> about the role that technology can play uh, in the future. And I'm just absorbing all this like a sponge. And again, some companies I think will do things that work for certain types of employees, but yeah, on that one, I guess I'm just not that smart. Well, I, uh, as I said, I've learned a lot here and uh, not to be a, 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 you know, plug your, your material, but um, I gotta, I have to read this book. Um, and it sounds like a number of other books that you've uh, written. 
And so uh, I'm going to do that because I think there's a, a lot to learn. And if you don't mind, since I, I now know you, I might shoot you a question from, from time to time. Uh, as long as it's not an email. Ah, okay. All right. Uh, on that note, uh, Phil has generously um, offered to make himself available uh, later today. If folks would like to maybe uh, ruminate on some of his his ideas and uh, here, because I, I can find myself, I'm like, I'm going to have to really think on what you shared here today. There's a lot, uh, a lot there. Um, but Phil would be, uh, is going to uh, join us at 5.30 today on this same, um, you know, webinar. If uh, folks want to ask questions or just, uh, you know, get to know him a little bit more uh, personally, uh, we'll, we'll open up any attendees to be panelists so we can have a little bit more of a, of a visit there. Um, and then we do have a couple of his books we'd like to give away uh, to a couple um, attendees here. So, so Phil, if you could give two numbers uh, between 100, I'm sorry, zero and 105, just what? I'm a, I'm a big Rush fan, so I'm going to go with 21 and 12. 20, oh, <laughs> okay. So uh, we have two winners here. Um, let's see, Christina Medina or Medina, pardon my pronunciation. Uh, we will send you uh, Phil's book. And then also V. Lay or Lie, again, pardon. Um, oh, someone is saying you can't use 12, but I think we can. Uh, the, the numbers change for the, just so you know how this works, the, the attendees, they come into the list and then when the numbers get called out, we kind of count down. So that, that number does move around. Uh, so it should be a different recipient. So uh, yeah, uh, Christina, Medina, Dina and B. Lai. Phil, thank you so very much. Um, every time we chat, I'm thoroughly stimulated and uh, and educated as well. And I, I really uh, I really appreciate the the insight that you brought to this really complicated subject. So uh, I look forward to learning more from you and see your next book and what that will be all about. Um, Thanks, David. I enjoyed it.